All right, so this, is, um, this panel is creating value, urban real estate and public space. And um, uh, I've got control of the remote. There we go. So there was an interesting article published uh, by Keenan Orfalia last August titled, Can You Put a Price Tag on Central Park? Uh, it's estimated the um, uh, incredible value of the land occupied by some of the great urban uh, parks including uh, US, uh, in the US, including San Francisco's Golden Gate Park, Fairmont Park in Philadelphia, Grant Park in Chicago, the Boston Commons, and so on. It was an, it was an interesting article. Central Park came in at $513 billion, which sounds like a steal to me. We have several New Yorkers in the audience who could probably put this deal together this afternoon. But the real story isn't what the land occupied by the parks might be worth in some appraiser's fantasy. Uh, it's the value that these great public spaces have created. Both the public good created for the community, which is their primary purpose, as well as the increased investment and property values for the land on or near these parks. And of course, if you ever actually developed uh, these parks themselves, you'd quickly destroy all the value that they create. This panel will focus on four linear park systems, three in their formative stages in Miami and one nearing its completion in, my, in Manhattan that we can learn from. Each panelist will share individual remarks followed by uh, some questions and discussion. My Miami panelists uh, include Meg Daly. Meg is an accomplished businesswoman with three decades of experience in sales and marketing, uh, but she's here with us today as the founder and president of Friends of the Underline. Many of the students here today have been involved in visioning, design, and real estate analyses for the Underline over the past few semesters, and I know you're, some of you are working on scenarios right now. Steve Owens is president of Swire Properties. Steve has a little mixed-use project happening in downtown. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, Steve will share Swire's experience creating public space in Brickell Key and plans for transforming the space beneath the Metro Mover into a linear park and urban trail connecting to Brickell City Center. Steve is also a member of the School of Architecture's uh, MRED Advisory Board. Vince Cinrello is the president and CEO of Florida East Coast Industries. FECI encompasses four major companies focusing on commercial development, logistics, infrastructure uh, in uh, all aboard Florida. Today, Vince will share some of FECI's ideas for transforming the Ludlam Rail Corridor into a six-mile linear trail activated by pockets of mixed-use development. Vince is also a member of the School of Architecture's Emirate Advisory Board. But we're going to start this panel with Phil Ahrens to my right. Phil is principal and founding partner of Millennium Partners, which owns and operates a portfolio worth over $4 billion. Uh, Millennium has pioneered new urbanism with major mixed-use development projects in New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., and San Francisco, as well as here in Miami. But Phil is also the founding chair of Friends of the High Line in New York City, which makes him the perfect combination of expertise to kick off this panel on real estate and public space. Phil? Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, stand so I can see the slides down below. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon and discuss the Highline story, and particularly its relevance to the topic of today's conference. A quick bit of history. The elevated railroad which became the Highline was constructed in the 1930s to resolve a dangerous traffic condition on the far west side of lower Manhattan where freight trains traveled on city streets. Accidents were frequent and noise and disruption were problematic. In fact, this is a picture of how the trains navigated down 10th Avenue with literally a man on horseback preceding the freight train in order to keep people off the track. A massive steel structure holding two train tracks was built above ground from 34th Street to Houston Street. Unfortunately, soon after it was finished, goods and services by rail soon became obsolete, and um, the tracks were rarely used after the 1970s. Separated from New York City's street grid and legally inaccessible, the High Line became a legal, e illegal refuge for some a reminder of the city's secret industrial past and an impediment to development from landowners. 
just a few of the very beautiful existing conditions. When, under intense pressure from landowners, the Giuliani administration decided, decided to demolish it, two young community residents, Robert Hammond and Joshua David, formed an alliance to save the High Line, and Friends of the High Line was born. When a mutual friend suggested that I had both public and private real estate experience and I might be helpful to them, I signed on to become the founding board chair. And to avoid any possible conflict of interest, I determined that I would not be involved in any private real estate developments in and around the High Line, a decision that was professionally expensive, um, but personally and ultimately <laughs> rewarding. The first task was to save the structure. The federal government's regulation on railroad abandonment, a lawsuit um, I helped finance, and the wonderful Rails to Trails program gave us time. With Giuliani finally gone, we went to the city to make the economic argument that the incremental tax revenues from development around the High Line would more than cover the cost to build the park. And amusingly, to the point first made, uh, we used assessment information from buildings around Central Park to prove our point to the city. An example of the High Line's consistently high opinion uh, of itself. <laughs> Um, this was the uh, argument we made in 2002. Revenues would be 262 million, costs would be 100 million. Not surprisingly, when we looked at it again in 2012, costs were 50% higher, but fortunately, as with all developers, the revenues had increased almost fourfold. <laughs> to generate those promised revenues, um, we approached the Bloomberg administration with a suggestion that we would offer an olive branch to the landowners under and around the High Line by supporting an area-wide rezoning that would allow prohibited residential um, development along the avenues at higher densities and permit air rights transfers from properties adjacent to the High Line to those sites. We started to see if we could generate some local excitement about what the High Line could become as a place for people. An international ideas, sorry. An international ideas competition was won by an Austrian architectural student who suggested a 1.5 mile lap pool. A roller coaster, sort of my favorite as well, uh, made the finals as well. But all the ideas were displayed at an exhibition we sponsored at Grand Central Station to try to show people what could be um, developed from the existing High Line structure. However, as fantasy turned to more thoughtful planning, we began to address the real needs in a comprehensive approach. We met repeatedly with the community to discuss the open space needs of the neighborhood. We hired a world-class architect and landscape firm, Diller Scafidio and Field Operations, um, I've just learned, being considered right here in Miami, so as to sustain a fundamental commitment to design excellence. And we actively cultivated private donor support and high media visibility to keep our supporters engaged and active. Fortunately, the arguments were convincing. The city supported the rezoning and the contribution of significant capital to cover a majority of the cost of construction. Private donors supplied the rest. Developers immediately began to build residential projects adjacent and around the High Line, many enlisting architects of international renown. Small, uh, this is now superseded by even more projects than are shown. Frank Gehry, John Nouvelle, Norman Foster, Zaha Hadid, all included in the pantheon of architects building in and around the High Line. The project, however, is still not done. The final phase which opened last year 
with a temporary design through the final segment, winds its way through Related's massive Hudson Yards project now under construction. Truly one of the most incredible urban developments of our century. How the High Line will work with these new buildings is still under discussion. The park itself became an, an architectural triumph and an international tourist attraction, generating 4.5 million visitors in the first year the first two sections were open. Now literally the second highest generating tourist attraction in New York City, a remarkable, if not amazing, achievement for an institution barely a decade old. But to close, particularly relevant to the topic of this conference, one great testament to the High Line's success as a place-making enterprise is the recent sale of the last large vacant lot near the High Line, which went under construction recently for residential development, reportedly at $1,100 per FAR foot, nearly $12,000 $500 per dirt foot. Certainly among the very highest prices ever achieved in New York. Um, and a long way from the values of the scrap yards and parking lots that only 15 years ago surrounded an abandoned railroad steel trestle. Thank you. It's Miami, these, these plants were really small when we started, now they've grown up and the speakers can't see the monitors. How's that? Perfect. Hi, my name is Meg Daly, it's so exciting to be here. University of Miami has been such a huge supporter of the underline, and everybody's talking about building great buildings and we hope to build a great park. And when done, the underline will be the longest under rail world class linear park and urban trail that's, con that's totally connected to transit. And that's an important message moving forward. We're talking about using the underutilized land below Metro Rail. Uh, currently, that's from Brickell down to Dade Land South. It's 9.7 miles, and we want to turn it into an iconic public space. There are eight transit stations that run through this corridor. And if you look at with this map, there's really a lot of great things going on in our community. The Ludlam Trail on the south end, we connect um, at Dade Land North Station. Um, we, we connect through Brickell, we want to get over the river, and we want to connect to the other bike ped um, initiatives throughout the community as well as the Rickenbacker. But we would be the spine for that connected network. And guess what? It's all of us who are making that happen. This is not being driven by a public agency. The current condition looks sort of like this. If anybody's ridden the impath, which runs below Metro Rail, um, it's a nine foot wide trail, um, but the corridor itself is 100 feet wide. It's three times as wide as the, um, as the High Line. And by the way, thank you for the High Line because you're the inspiration for the Underline. There's 28 intersections that pierce the path. We're at grade, the High Line is above rail, so we have a different set of challenges. There's no lighting, there's no seating, there's no amenities, you can't even get a glass of water. And there's no, land, no planned landscaping, and because of that, it's unsafe and homes and businesses turn away from the space. So our vision, and these images are courtesy of the University of Miami School of Architecture last spring, is to create two um, trails. One is for pedestrians, one is for bicyclists. We want to separate them, we want to straighten it, we want to widen it. We want to add lighting, seating, and amenities. We want to create two things a bike ped corridor for commuters. I can walk, I can bike, I can connect to transit, and we also would be a recreational corridor for people to you know, ride a bike with their kids, skate, whatever the case may be, but we're integrating all modes of transit. And then we also want to add strategically planned park nodes along the corridor, so it's sort of a necklace. As you arrive at each destination at the transit station, there'll be a park node to visit. The benefits, I mean, you did a great job explaining the benefits, and we're so, we're, we're a year in, and it's very difficult to project what will happen, 
But if the precedents before us show us what could happen, like the High Line, like the Belt Line in Atlanta, the 606 in Chicago, you know, it's really a great return on investment for the, for the community. Um, increased property values, um, new tax revenue, as well as alternative ways to get around our city. Millennium Park in Chicago is actually a beautiful, iconic park built above, above a parking lot. So we're finding ways to use what's these leftover lands and properties that, the, that, that is owned by the public and give them back to the community in a meaningful way. So actually, if we can get our plan done and we can get funded, we can start building in 2016 because we have zero land cost. And that's really why we're working so hard to move quickly and keep on the, build on the momentum that we currently have. Douglas Station right now, which is in the center of the underline, uh, there's an RFQ out for it now. It's a five acre parcel and Transit is leading the initiative for development at that station. Transit really hasn't had a whole lot of success in this community in building out along the transit corridor. But because of the possibility of the underline, we've had those contending for developing that space approach us and say, hey, we want to re reorient our development so it faces the underline, which by the way is not fully funded, has not been built, and has not been implemented. So I think we've really captured the imagination of what could be. And then we want to talk about this transit hub development. So if you build nearby a transit station as well, we're now giving the ability for people to get where they need to go, possibly without driving a car. So this is sort of an ugly secret about Miami-Dade County. We're the fourth most dangerous place in the country for pedestrians. We are the most dangerous place for bicyclists in the state. So are we all, are we all bad walkers, bikers, and drivers? Maybe. Or maybe is there an infrastructure problem that needs to be addressed? We're going to be adding hundreds of acres of new green space to the 400,000 residents along the corridor within a 10-minute walk. And we are a 501c3 organization. We're nonprofit. We're really taking a page out of your handbook. Um, and we're advocating for the vision and for the funding and the implementation. And then once the construction's complete, we'll be responsible for ongoing maintenance, funding, and programming. So in a very short period of time, one year, we incorporated a year ago, and it's really because of precedents that have been so successful that it allowed us to move at this pace. We've gone from an idea to initiative. Uh, we actually went through our master planning selection about a month ago. We, have, we are going to be announcing in March 1 one of the leading landscape design teams in the world. And we had a really incredible group, which means everybody knows that this can be exceptional, fantastic, unbelievable, which is really what we're all about. We have broad-based base support. This is actually transit-owned land. And so we're taking it back, and we're going to give it back to the community and as, as an asset. The Parks Department is sort of like a shadow staff. They're doing lots of work behind the scenes for us. And we have endorsements from numerous organizations, including our friends from the Miami Association of Realtors, I think that you're here, uh, the University of Miami, Donna Shalala, and many other organizations have endorsed and funded us to date. So that's me. I'm the road runner. Uh, and if anybody wants to jump on board and run with me, I really wish you would, because it's going to take a village to make this initiative happen at the speed that we want it to happen. And I hope that you'll join in, continue to support us, because we want to do that. We want to start building in 2016. Thanks so much. Hi, my name is Steve Owens, and I'm with Swire Properties, and we have a small uh, development here in Brickell, uh, Brickell City Center. Uh, you see the uh, rendering there of what we have, and we'll talk about transit land. Uh, this is uh, just quickly a, a uh, master plan, really, of the, of the total development. Uh, it's 8.3 uh, million square feet, so it's on five city blocks. And uh, I should stop now and say a special thank you to our, my friend second to the left here, because if the Millennium Group hadn't sold us the old Brickell Tennis Center, we would be missing the hole in the donut here. But uh, thanks to Aaron, they did. And we're very uh, pleased to have been able to move forward with this. So uh, again, thank you. Uh, this is a, a transit uh, project. Um, we are redeveloping the transit station. 
And so we have learned the meaning of working with the Metro Day Transit Authority. Um, as a part of that, we were looking at how we could make sure that all of the surrounding areas as we dealt with the transit station itself could become more beneficial to the community. And what we soon realized as we were leasing the uh, land under the, under the, the line, um, what could it be? And the thought really was very quickly, this should be a green space, it should be a public space, um, it really should be an investment in the community. Now, in dealing with Miami-Dade Transit Authority, their standards um, and their protocol were somewhat, let's say, challenging as they really didn't have a format for what we were proposing. Um, but we did persevere. We've leased this for 99 years. Um, they immediately said, well, who's going to build it? And we said, we will. And they said, well, then who's going to maintain it? And we said, we will. And they said, well, there must be something wrong with this picture. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I say that in jest, it, it, it took quite a long time, but we were able to work through these issues. Um, we are redeveloping the station itself, which is to the, to the lower end of the uh, slide, uh, and that is well, under, well underway if you've been by the construction site, and we'll, we'll have that finished within about nine months. So it was, the idea was, what could we do with this in terms of making it a linear park? Um, we really weren't thinking so much about uh, how, what we would call it in particular. We, we used Garden Walk, we used Greenway, but really the goal was to create a public space where there was benefit to the community, where people could actually have a pedestrian experience. And the goal, quite frankly, was to take it forward. We leased it, this area for as far as it was a boundary with the property that we owned. There's one site between us and the Miami River that's owned by a third party, uh, but the goal was in working with planning department was that ultimately would be required with the development of that site, and therefore we could join the Miami River Greenway, which had been around as a concept for quite a long time. It was a, a pedestrian uh, walking experience really along the river, and our goal was to, to join that from Brickell City Center, continue to the west, as you see, the, indicated in blue, and eventually join up with the uh, green space that was uh, hopefully going to occur below the metro rail line, now more properly defined by Meg and her team as, as the underline. So our concept is a very small microcosm of what, uh, what is now being planned with the underline, but really it was the same principle. That the only difference is we're, we're doing it uh, ourselves, privately funded and uh, privately maintained. But I think the principles are very much the same. The goal of providing a public space for our pedestrian uh, experience uh, for those that live in, and work in West Brickell uh, was the goal. Um, this is actually the photographs taken when we started talking to Miami-Dade Transit. This is what it looked like under their rail. Um, people often talk about uh, Brickell as being this dynamic booming area and it was, it was always this, this great marketplace uh, where it wasn't like other parts of our city. Um, well, I, I beg to differ. This, these photographs were only taken three and a half years ago. Um, but you see what you can do when you put something like this in place. This is the, the new Metro Rail Station. Um, with a significant public plaza that is being created, and we think that's going to be a real uh, gathering spot um, and activity center for, for West Brickell. Um, I think the, the better reference to where we're going with this is what we did on Brickell Key. Um, we have the Brickell Key Bay Walk, which we started a number of years ago. It, it's really taken us 25 years to develop the island, and we still have one site left next to the Mandarin Hotel. Uh, when we initiated discussions with the various master planners that we brought in to talk about Brickell Key, and this is way back when I was quite young and had hair, um, but it was, a, it was an interesting idea to have planners from elsewhere in the country come in, and, and, and when we talked about having a public walkway around the island, I don't think there was anyone that endorsed it. 
Everyone thought it was a bad idea. When we brought in the top salespeople for, for uh, residential apartments, they all said, not a good idea. If you look at how Brickell Avenue is developing, people want uh, privacy. They do not want the public to, to, to come onto the island. It will really handicap your ability to sell and develop there. And we, as developers, took the opposite view. So against all the professional advice that we paid a lot of money to, to have, we went in the opposite direction. And we embraced this idea of a Brickell Key Bay Walk. And we embraced the idea of being part of the Brickell community. It was OK for people to come across the bridge and walk their babies around the island or jog or ride bicycles uh, to enjoy the, the uh, bayfront. We thought this was part of engaging, really, uh, the urban area and activating it, really. Now, I think what it, it's proven at the end of the day is that if, if we invest in quality public spaces, if we create uh, a public experience um, in, a, in, a, in a vibrant, positive way, it, it actually creates value. The values on Brickell Key have never been higher. Of course, you'd say that about many condominiums in Miami. But I think the, the value that we've experienced as developers has been uh, very much a, um, a, a personal reward to us as a company. At the end of the day, uh, developing here in Miami in, in this moment we're in, it's all, it, 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 there's a lot of euphoria, there's a terrific amount of uh, glitz and excitement and sexiness to everything that's happened. Uh, every week there's a new uh, more exciting project with a, with a greater Starkitect name to it. Um, but we can't lose sight of the fact that at the end of the day, this is a city we all want to live in. I can tell you, I live on Brickell Key. I walk around this island. My grandkids walk around this island. Um, and it's a, it's a very, very significantly better place to, to live and to work and to stay if you're at the Mandarin uh, because of the investment we've made in the Baywalk. And so again, I would encourage all of us as we think about how we're developing our city here to think long and hard about how we may take ever so small a piece of land, like the little narrow bit that we have under the metro rail, um, and see what we can do with that to, to invest in our community to make it uh, all that it can be. And I think the greatest example of that, of course, is what we saw in the beginning with the High Line in New York. It's a great, great example to follow. So the, uh, the themes of, uh, of our development are really are entirely consistent with, with, the, uh, with the group um, as you know, the, the projects that they've already discussed. Um, legacy of Florida East Coast Industries um, you know, goes back over 100 years, right? So we have a lot of interesting assets um, that the company's owned for quite some time, most of which you know, had not been paid attention to. Um, and so um, we, you know, we controlled railroads in the state of Florida now um, for a long time, and not all of those rail lines are actually active. And, um, and so uh, one, of those, uh, one of those assets is quite unique in that it's a 10-kilometer trail, so just over six miles, that connects Dade Land um, all the way up to the airport. And it's actually an asset that I would argue most of the people in this room don't even know exists. And, um, and in fact, for the first three or four years uh, when I arrived at the company, you know, we didn't talk about it either. I mean, it was, it was a, you know, it had a spot on the balance sheet, and, uh, but with no real plan or ambition around what we were going to do because the, the, the knee-jerk reaction was, well, it's, you know, it's 100 feet wide, and it's, you know, 10 kilometers long. Like, what, the, what are we going to do with that, right? And, it, you know, it got backburnered and backburnered um, until we surrounded it with a team that actually focuses 100% of their time on trying to determine what the master plan of this thing looks like. And so, as with most of our projects, we really try to distill them into, you know, its most simplistic form. So, you know, this, this cartoon is really a, a way to describe how we think about the development of a 100-foot of a wide trail, um, where you've got this wonderful interconnectivity of these nodes, right? And so, like the underlying project, where those nodes um, will be at the metro rail stations, our nodes are at the major intersections um, of this particular rail line. 
And so, uh, and so when we started our master planning process about, uh, about a year ago, maybe just a little bit over that, we really you know, started with the nuts and bolts of you know, what are the existing entitlements, what does the zoning look like, what are the adjacent uses, and how do we make sense of development inside of that corridor to make sure that we are, we are both respecting what we are adjacent to, but we are reinventing or creating an environment that people actually want to visit, right? And um, it, you know, one of the things that struck me, you know, I'm not a native Floridian, and I, and I lived in New York for quite a long time before I came here, and you know, there's a fair amount of open space in, in, um, in, in South Florida, but when you visit some of these parks, as I did with my two kids when we first got here, I mean, they are wildly underutilized, right? And so you've got some very large open spaces where, where, there's, you know, where the public engagement is something less than stellar, unlike living in New York, where because your apartments are so small and the living areas are small, you have a tendency to engage with the rest of the world, and you do that in, in, uh, in public spaces. And this, so this is a little bit different. And so as we started to think about what we were going to do on this trail, you know, the options ranged all the way from, well, let's just create a trail, right? So 100 feet wide, and wouldn't that be dynamic? But, but as a private company, right, the economic proposition to us was a little bit lackluster. So we needed to figure out a way to, um, to drive the economic value of what we owned. Um, but more importantly, the engagement of a trail environment, environment like this is driven by the commercial environment that is constructed around it. And, and because of the nature of what we were building through, we were literally, this rail line runs through neighborhoods, we had to consider commercial real estate and residential real estate both within the right-of-way and, and at these very important nodes. So that was really the thought process behind you know, how we went about the public planning. So as you look at this, you know, this, this cartoon rendering, you'll note a, a significant amount of density in and around uh, the major cross section, the, the major cross streets um, of the rail line, and, and we are building a ribbon, right, park um, that, that traverses those particular neighborhoods. Let's see if this thing works. Here we go. Um, and so this gives you a perspective of, um, of, of where it starts and where it ends, right? So, um, so for those of you who have been to um, Dadeland Station, right, there's the, the big box retailers there, there's a sports authority, et cetera, there's a very large parking garage for the Metro Rail. That's where the corridor begins. Um, um, it actually abuts the, um, it abuts the Dadeland Mall um, parking lot. There's a tire store there. And then it pounds through um, a series of neighborhoods, mostly residential on the south side, um, and it gets progressively more industrial as you head north up towards the airport, but it literally, it literally ends at the, at the airport. So this was a, this was a rail line that the company used a long time ago. It, it used to service existing industrial clients um, that, the, that the freight railroad had. Those clients no longer exist. And, um, and so therein lies, um, therein lies the, you know, the, the abandonment of that, of that rail line. So the, the rail line was officially abandoned some years ago. Um, and, uh, and this, is, this is about the revitalization of that. And so, you know, one of the things I would point out here, I don't have a laser pointer, but, um, but if you can think about the connectivity, you know, from the airport down south to Dadeland, to the underline to downtown, right, up through Swire's project along the river and follow it all the way back, you can literally create a giant ring around a massive concentration, right, of both residences and, and commercial real estate in the city of Florida, right, in the city of Miami. Um, so this is a rather unique opportunity to actually sew these things together. We, in fact, have never sat down as a group to plan any of this, right? So, which is a little bit weird, um, but um, perhaps we should. But in independently, you know, now for a couple of years, we've been working on this, not realizing that the underline was going to come on, not realizing that you know, beneath the metro mover was going to be revitalized, right, and along the river. And lo and behold, though, the, most of these things connect with each other, right? So there's really there's an incredible opportunity to create a linear park system um, in the middle of the city that, 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 quite frankly, right, dwarfs what occurred at the High Line, right, from, from, you know, from, you know, from its length and ultimately you know, what can occur around it. And so um, this, is a, this is a picture of an existing condition on the north edge. Um, of the corridor, not terribly different than some of the other existing conditions that the, uh, that the rest of the team has shared with you today. Um, and this is what you would expect an abandoned railroad 
corridor to look like, right? Um, you can imagine, you know, that's, that's obviously a daytime photo. I don't even want to know what happens at night um, there. We, we, we don't, I don't visit often. So, um, but 100 feet is, I mean, as you get into master planning, while it doesn't sound wide, there's a, there's a lot that can be done inside of 100 feet, like a lot. And so we have these conversations with our neighbors who don't believe anything can be done with inside of 100 feet, but that's a, that's a different challenge that we have as part of the project. Um, but generally speaking, you know, that's what can be done inside of 100 feet. So now that's a, that is a, a, a residence, right, with, um, with a park environment, right? Now we don't, the, 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 um, the, the trail is entitled for about 1,200 units today from a residential perspective. And then we've got another, um, we've got a lot of commercial real estate that we can build at the nodes. Uh, we're trying to increase the density and actually push the density into the nodes. So while we don't anticipate a lot of this low density uh, environment, actually further, further south, you may see some of this to be more in character with the, uh, with the adjacent uses. Um, another, at Bird Road, um, another indication of what the existing condition looks like today. Um, and then this is what we think that can look like. And so at the major nodes, what we, and Bird Road is actually running from the upper left-hand corner to the lower right-hand corner um, of, this, of this picture, uh, we actually anticipate bridging over and building on top of a lot of these major thoroughfares that cross the right-of-way, right? So um, to, create a, you know, to create a continuity and to, and to physically move people from one side of these major, these major roadways to another, uh, we anticipate bridging over and then having um, some pretty significant density um, where it's appropriate. Um, and so that's, that's how we think about, you know, those major nodes and those major intersections, really creating a, a, uh, a, a vertical, a dense vertical environment uh, over those particular intersections. Um, and this is in the south. So this is, this is primarily a residential neighborhood. Um, and, um, and as we get further south, I had mentioned before, the goal is to, is to create a lower density, um, you know, more park-like environment to be, to be consistent with, uh, you know, with our neighbors. That actually is quite nice, right? You can imagine why the existing neighbors, that doesn't look as seedy as what, you know, as what exists on the north end of this corridor. Um, you, can, you can imagine why the neighbors have encroached in our property. So we, we it, to protect our rights as a private owner, um, we've, we've gone out and surveyed, resurveyed the entire, the entire um, corridor and right of way. Um, you know, we have well in excess of, you know, 50 encroachments where major structures have been built um, into our right of way. And so we're going through a process right now to make sure that that gets rectified. Um, and um, therein lies some of the friction with our adjacent landowners. Um, but, the, but the company really had not paid attention to this for a long period of time, which is why people, you know, decided to take this property as their own. And, um, and uh, but that won't, be the, that won't be the situation for a while. Um, you know, this is, the, um, this is the, the very south end at Dadeland Station um, where, where density and, and, and zoning allows for us to build what we consider to be a, an anchor, um, you know, for the project where you build a gateway and you, you gradually, you know, pull people through, you know, the corridor, creating commercial real estate environments um, along the way that really pull people through the corridor, right? So there's a reason to go there, right? So that, you know, that while, while we are a fan of, of linear parks, you know, my guess is that if people arrived at Dadeland South and parked their vehicle and walked into the corridor, if there was nothing for them to, to visit in the middle of the corridor or north, you'd see most of this traffic be heavily concentrated on the south end of this thing, right? So the goal is to create a series of environments that actually pull people from Dadeland up through the corridor um, to really activate some of the nodes that are further north, right? We, we, we see the development starting in the south uh, first and then, and, then, um, and then advancing all the way to the north. And, um, and as we think about the connectors, we had talked about pocket, pocket parks and, and what can be done there, you know, sort of, you know, as we connect, you know, the, the, uh, the commercial real estate environments and the residential real estate environments, we have these incredible opportunities to build these little pocket parks, right, which are places for, you know, people to stop, places for, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the adjacent residences to go and play with their kids, et cetera, and really create an environment um, that's, that's unique in, in, in Miami-Dade. It really doesn't exist today. So 
That's how we're thinking about it. Great, okay, you've done a great job as panelists uh, summarizing your, your initiatives in a short amount of time. Uh, and I'm gonna give you each at least one quick question. Um, and Phil, I don't know if you were aware of uh, all these initiatives, but now you are. Uh, a few and, of them, yes. Uh, so the big question that we wanna ask you is what would you say is the most important lesson that can be learned from the Highline experience that, that Miami could learn from for these initiatives? Well, I think from what, what, what we're hearing, you're sort of learning it uh, already. But I think the great strength and success of the High Line um, came about because of a willingness to build a consensus among a wide range of different people, community residents, real estate, landowners, government. Um, everybody sort of was enlisted as part of the process. And I think if you really as real estate, private real estate developers as, as some of us on the panel are, if you sort of step aside and look at the larger public interest, um, then you really can make all of these great initiatives here uh, in Miami happen. Um, but it requires building um, strong consensus mm -hmm. among a large group of divergent interests. But it can be done, and it sounds like it is being done. So, and it must hurt a little bit because as you go around and you report on these fantastic values that were created along the, um, the High Line and you could not participate in any of that as, as you've noted, putting your real estate hat on, uh, Millennium Partners operates in, in great urban gateway cities, New York, Miami, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Has your involvement with the High Line changed the way you look at investment and development opportunities? Yeah, definitely, although I think Millennium always tried to focus on urban placemaking, which is sort of the topic of today. Um, we focus um, repeatedly on transit-oriented development, which we believe passionately um, allows for greater density and can support greater density. We've had good um, uh, urban design on the perimeter of all the projects, which I think is critical to their success. So yes, I, I think there's been a spillover from one uh, area of interest to the other. Um, and I think it's been tremendously beneficial to have had the opportunity um, to work on the High Line for uh, the, my professional uh, activities as well. Okay, Meg, mm -hmm. you've had um, students in both architecture and now real estate uh, running some scenarios, doing visioning and design work, and now uh, actually some real estate students working with the studio to run a couple of scenarios for transit-oriented development. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that some real estate development on, over, or along the underline will help realize the vision? Would it, could it help finance and activate it? Well, absolutely. Um, I actually want to thank University of Miami for being so involved in this project because, you know, when you have a great idea and you have no money, where do you go? You go to a university and ask for help. So that's, that's the first thing we did. And, and having that studio class last spring was really instrumental for bringing a lot of the stakeholders into the same room and we didn't talk about money. And so with that activity, it's sort of like they make it their own and you don't have to say what's the price tag, you sort of become part of the vision and then it becomes your own. Um, likewise, as we go through our master planning process, which is imminent, uh, we're gonna have our public meetings in April, you know, we're gonna be reaching out to not just the residents but the business community and if development happens along this corridor, that's your return on investment. Um, it's, and it's also giving back to the community the green space that we haven't made available to them. So it's sort of a win-win. Um, if it pays for itself through development with creative financing as well as you know, public money, but we need, the, we need the support of the developers to realize the return on investment. Now, Steve, what are you gonna call you're under the Metro Mover space. I guess we'll call it the Little Unline. <laughs> the Little Unline. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, th there's the Green Link, right? Maybe you could get that from, from Meg from previously. Well, uh, why did Swire feel that the adoption and improvement of, of the Metro Mover easement was, was important to Brickell City Center? Well, it's, you know, it was, it was a, a bit of land there that if left in the hands, in all due respect to the transit authority, it would never be nothing, much more than what you saw in the photographs. And it really was, uh, I think, um, 
it was up, it was up to us to decide what, what was going to happen with it, because they weren't going to do anything. So it was really about pri private initiative. Um, Brickell City Center is a, is a very significant development, and so every opportunity we have to create any sense of public space and any sense of, of green is, is critically important. And I think that was perhaps as big a incentive uh, as anything. And the fact that it was good urban planning, I think, was the second part. But, you know, it's, to me, it all goes in concert. I, I didn't mention, um, but right next to this area, we at one time had 50 of the largest and oldest trees in all of Brickell. In fact, uh, we had them evaluated and they were, they were considered, I think there were three or four other trees in Brickell that were of the same vintage, but otherwise these were the original oldest trees in Brickell. All of those trees now are residing in Museum Park. We moved 50 trees, it cost us $700,000. So you talk about creating green space, you talk about uh, investing in public benefit, it's not always as a developer that you do it where you receive a, an economic benefit, but the community in which you're building receives a benefit. And so I'd like to challenge other developers to think in that same terms. Perhaps they will, some of them, uh, perhaps not. Uh, but it is about investing in the future, and it's about taking a long-term view. We could have easily cut all those trees down and mitigated uh, the cost. Uh, instead, we had... Uh, Tibetan monks blessed them, and we moved them all, and every one of them is still alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Vince, the, the, so the central theme of this panel is that investment in public space can benefit both the community and uh, private property owners. How could the inclusion of some development help fund, activate, and maintain a public trail and park along the Ludlam Corridor? Yeah, I think that, I mean, w for us, right, without the ability to drive value on the commercial side of this, right, our ability to deliver park space would be somewhat constrained, right? And so the way we envision this is, um, at, you know, as we develop, we create, the, we create the public space that's integral to the development. Along the way, we, we, um, we think the likely um, transition of that public space is that we will actually sell um, or transition that, um, that, that public space to public ent entities that will be responsible, uh, that will own it, right? And then we will, we will set up an association that will be responsible for, you know, for the maintenance of the entirety of the thing. So I think that the, it's, it's a bit, it's chicken and egg, right? So, but I think that as we commence with the development on this thing, uh, you know, we will create the green space and then, and then you know, set in place a mechanism um, that is, that is in place forever and funded forever um, to take care of it. And, and you know, I think like Steve had referenced, we are somewhat cautious about handing over the green space to, um, you know, to, you know, parks departments, et cetera, like without our involvement, right? While we think that they can do an incredible job, you know, long term as a steward of the asset, we would like to be involved in the planning of that and making sure that the investment that we've made is you know, properly maintained and properly programmed. So we think it's really important. And I know the Miami-Dade Commission is organizing not one, but two public workshops. Lucky Charrettes. So anybody wants to come out and talk to Vince more about this, um, I'm sure he'll be there happy to talk to anyone who'd like to share their ideas on it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, and it'll be twice as good because there'll be two Charrettes, not one. Right, right. Two Charrettes means a doubly better project. Um, so um, um, I'll, right. <laughs> Uh, Meg, why don't I come back to you, uh, maybe to, uh, to, um, to close, because I know I'm getting the signals that uh, they'd like us to wrap up. We're paying for the, we're paying for the sins of the prior panels, and <laughs> we'll make up some time for them here. Um, uh, Meg, the, um, why, why should the development community um, get involved? Why should private property owners and developers support the underlying initiative, and how can they get involved? So I think with great stories like the High Line and with the 606, I think it's pretty much proven, and we didn't make this up, that it works. And if you have a beautiful green space, it's your new front yard, it's new, your new backyard, and why not build to that because that view is not there now. Um, and how can you get involved? 
Okay, info at theunderline.org is my email. <laughs> www.theunderline.org is our website. Uh, we're gonna have public engagement meetings. We are very transparent. We embrace anyone who wants to step up and assist us. And, it's, and like I said before, it's gonna take a village. It's really gonna take a city you know, to make this happen because it's a big vision, but I think Miami really deserves it. It's terrific, thank you very much. What a great panel, please give them a hand. Thanks, good job. <laughs>